and welcome back. How are we getting on, everybody? Pretty good, yeah, pretty good. So today we're joined by a very special guest, Mr. Paul Foote. How about you tell us about yourself? Oh, hello. Do you want me to say? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's me. It's me, Paul Foote speaking. <laughs> yes, yes. Thanks for getting on the podcast. The podcast is the Awfully Irish podcast. It's a podcast um, based on Irish themes, and I shall be speaking with considerable authority about all things Irish. <laughs> um, I'm very pleased to have been invited to come on the Awfully Irish podcast. I can't help feeling that I've mainly been asked to go on the Awfully Irish podcast because I'm a comedian who, who the people on the Awfully Irish podcast know about and not to do with my Irish roots of which I have none. <laughs> so ultimately, uh, that is the reason I've been asked. It's nothing to do with the Irish connection and therefore having me on the podcast is a grave insult to me and my family who are of non-Irish stock, a combination of English, German and Polish. Many of my relatives, of course, the majority of them, of course, are dead, <laughs> either because of the fact that they lived hundreds of years ago, my ancestors, they would be dead anyway, or uh, because um, they met an untimely death uh, by being run over by a lorry or bus or other accidents, or because they were murdered, all of them are now turning in their grave to see that I'm selling out my soul of, of mainly Polish and German with a bit of English extraction to the on the altar of the Irish podcast. But of course, even though I know that I'm not Irish and have no Irish blood in me and that I'm an imposter, I'm, of course, willing to go onto the Awfully Irish podcast because I know that the Awfully Irish podcast is a stepping stone career-wise to other podcasts. For example, the uh, uh, Welsh, uh, We Are Welsh podcast is considered a highly prestigious podcast that has more viewers than the Awfully Irish podcast. It has 150 more viewers and it's expanding. Uh, the Awfully Irish podcast is actually, uh, has 150 fewer viewers than the Welsh one with slightly contracting numbers, been contracting slightly. Uh, so actually I've chosen a good time to go on the Awfully Irish podcast because uh, in two or three months time, I'd be humiliating myself, selling my soul to the Irish, but for no gain for far fewer viewers, uh, with uh, very unlikely to ever appear on the Welsh, the We Are Welsh podcast. But I know I have a window of opportunity to leapfrog from the Awfully Irish podcast into the We Are Welsh podcast and ultimately onto the uh, Scottish, uh, city, <laughs> city Scottish podcast, which is the jewel in the crown of the podcast. It has over uh, 476 viewers. Um, so I'm hoping to get on that one one day. So that's me. I'm looking forward to being on the Awfully Irish podcast and, and looking forward to the questions that I'll be asked. I know it's going to be hard, a grilling on Irish subjects that will go on for over um, three hours, but I'm waiting to take the challenge. Well, thanks There's for coming on. Well, up. well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, uh, well, obviously, Mr. Porfoot, uh, thank you for coming on. Even, even though we're not as uh, prestigious as the uh, We Are Welsh podcast, we, uh, we're glad to have you here. I, I thank you. For, I, I'm pleased to be on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. 
No. For all the reasons I've given. Of course, of course. Of course. So I won't get into it again, I won't go through that again, of course. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's, 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 there's it's, no need to go through it again. I've said that, and there's no need to repeat any of that. And I won't right. do that. Right. We'll... I, well, I will repeat it. No. Uh, sometimes I'll repeat bits of what I've said, but only for legal reasons, just for legal reasons. <laughs> Because there are legal reasons why I have to repeat some parts, um, just uh, to make sure they're properly worded for the the We Are Welsh podcast and the um, Silly Scottish podcast do have uh, very powerful lawyers who will watch this podcast with a fine tooth comb and make sure I haven't said anything that is defaming their podcasts. And that's why I will sometimes repeat things for legal reasons. But other than that, I won't repeat anything because that would be to the detriment of the this podcast, which I wouldn't want to do, even though the numbers are declining. Mm. And this is ultimately a springboard to move into the Welsh and Scottish podcast areas. Have you been approached about going on Absolutely Aussie? Oh, well, that's the dream. That's the dream. <laughs> um, actually, well, I say that. I have been. Um, the Absolutely Aussie I've been on, um, uh, and that was the reason I got on here, of course. The Absolutely Aussie, um, I did that last month. It was considered a huge success. Um, I was, uh, only, there were only six viewers, but uh, they said it was a success. And um, they said, you're ready, having been on that one, ready for the awfully Irish. That's his next step. Um, so your, I'd say your end goal then is uh, the the greatly German podcast. Greatly German and uh, the um, powerfully Polish. Powerfully Polish and the uh, oh frig I'm Finnish <laughs> podcast. <laughs> well. well, all of those obviously very very high league podcasts up there with the likes of Joe Rogan and uh, you know good good luck oh thank you thank I'm you I'm sure after this and the uh, We Are Wells podcast and the Silly Scottish you'll get there oh, th- thank you oh, yeah. of course, of course. so uh, how did you get into comedy exactly well um, by chance yes uh, chance uh, uh, I was uh, at university and I was doing maths degree and then people said I was funny and I should go on stage. So I went on stage and I thought I would try it one time to see what it was like. Only one time I thought I would never do it again. It would just be one time. And I thought on my deathbed I can say, I have been on stage. I didn't, of course, at that stage. I, I only thought it would be a one time appearance. I didn't dream, of course, of the Awfully Irish podcast or anything of that nature. Um, Which is the Awfully Irish podcast, I should point out in a tangential point, is the only podcast I've ever done that isn't alliterative. All the others are too alliterative. We are Welsh, silly Scottish, Awfully Irish. Um, It should really be... um, I, I, I am Irish. I am Irish, yes. I am Irish, which mm. is, of course, a lie. I'm not. Anyway, so I went <laughs> on stage. I went on stage and um, and uh, I decided immediately that was going to be my career. And then I just uh, have been doing that ever since. That was in the 1990s. 1993 was my first appearance. And then, uh, in fact, only the other day, it was my 26th. No, 27th comedy birthday. I have a comedy birthday every year on the 7th of February. Each year is my comedy birthday. That was my 27th comedy birthday. Approaching 30th comedy birthday, what's that going to be like? Uh, well, it's, uh, uh, it will depend slightly on the coronavirus crisis. It could, I mean, if the coronavirus is still going on, it'll be a, a virtual event um, from my lavatory. But um, if it's the coronavirus crisis is off, then it could be a live event. Yes, I'll have to look up what day of the week it will be. Now, the last one, uh, it will take me too long to go through 30 
years, including leap years. But uh, yes, it, it will be, uh, I have a live event, I think, uh, for my 30th comedy event, uh, birthday. Should be good. I had a live event for my, when I did my 1000th gig. That was many years ago. I had a live event for that because I keep all list of all the performances I've done, live performances in a book. And I'm currently on 4,000 something. But anyway, um, yes, I'll have an event for the uh, 30th comedy birthday, I think. That's a good idea, yeah. Don't get a, don't have too many now. Don't have too many drinks. Oh, well, actually, you say that. I never, I never drink on, um, when I'm performing, of course. Right, yeah. Apart from when it was my 1,000th gig, then I did drink and that was the only time I've performed drunken. I was completely drunken and it went very well, but everyone was on my site because it was my 1,000th performance. But of course, I can speak from authority now about the drinking power of the Irish, because some years ago I arrived in Ireland to do a gig and it was in Galway and it was the day after St. Patrick's Day. Which I is, that, is it St. Patrick's Day the 17th of March? It is, yeah. Yes. So it was the 18th of March. So it was the day after St. Patrick's Day. So all the Irish people were very hungover because they'd had St. Patrick's Day the day before. And they all said, oh, we can't drink too much because we've got heavy hangover. This is definitely not a d day for drinking. If there's any day when Irish people don't want to drink too much, it's the day after St. Patrick's Day. But they could still drink me under the table. They still drank substantially more than I could drink, even when they were weakened by the hangovers of the day after St. Patrick's Day. So that's one of the ways I know that I'm not Irish. <laughs> I can't drink as much. It is, it's, a, it's a horrible few days now when it's, uh, you have the one day where you're drinking, the next day in the morning you feel shite, and then you get that faithful text where it's like, Oh yeah, you're coming out tonight. You just stomach drops, gets into position to be absolutely destroyed again. Liver oh. is screaming. It must be hard work going through that 365 days of the year. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. It's a non-stop hangover. I've just found out the 7th of February, 2023, will be a Tuesday. What a good day for a celebration. So that's going to be on exactly. Tuesday. I'm going to schedule, I'm going to write that down now because I hadn't thought of having a, a 30th comedy birthday, but I'm definitely going to have one. Being a Tuesday, I probably won't be on tour in a theatre so I can organise my own event yeah. and have, invite people to it, a special event. That's a good idea. Very good idea. Yeah. Thomas? <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that sounds great. You were you did you already had your own like event or, or something, didn't you? I read about that somewhere. I had an event. Apparently. Oh, I wonder what it was for. Was it for my uh, comedy birthday? It could have been for your comedy birthday now, actually. Oh. Or was it for when when did where did you read about it? So I'll, I'll have a look now on my phone. But I was reading about it earlier. It was like he had that you had an event somewhere. Where, when, who was there? I couldn't tell you, but. <laughs> ah, I wish I could remember what event it was. <laughs> um, like from shows, not shows, maybe. Um, oh, I can't. Hello, my Thomas. Oh, you had a the Paul Foot Festival. Hello. In 2009. Oh, yes. Yes, that was about 12 years ago, the Paul Foot Festival. It was a whole day event, I remember it now. It was the whole day of comedy. Yes, yes, yes. This gives me an idea to what to do on the 7th of February, 2023. Yes, it was a whole 12 hour show. Wow. Well, it wasn't, you didn't have to be there. It wasn't a show all day. There were shows as part of it, and then there were other events like question and answer sessions and sketches okay. and art sessions and all sorts of things. Yes, I think I will have on the 7th of February, 
2023 maybe a maybe a several day event a residential event to celebrate my 30th comedy birthday with events going on uh, medieval jousting and uh, all sorts of other events what a good idea yes i've forgotten about that the pool foot fest the pool foot festival yes you've given me an idea for the name the pool foot festival i would never have thought of that name in a million years, but now I've thought of it, the Paul Foot Festival, 7th of February, 2023, the Paul Foot Festival. Great. Well, um, what was I gonna ask? Uh, so yeah, I was wondering, do you remember like your first gig where you were like, holy shit, this is big. And like, do you remember how you were feeling and everything? Well, one of the ones that was a seminal one when where I was doing one in America on a show called Last Comic Standing. And one of the shows, it had 3000 people in the audience, which was a lot for me at that time. And also 15 million people were watching on television. Oh, wow. And that really cured me of my stage nerves. I used to have terrible stage nerves before then. In fact, I was the opposite to other performers. Most performers, maybe a bit nervous before going on, but they calm down once they get their first laugh and they're fine, you know. But I used to go on and then, the, then I would just get increasingly nervous throughout the performance until I fell apart. And also, I got more nervous as my career developed, and not less nervous. But anyway, eventually, when I did this show and there were 15 million people on television, it cured me of my nerves, and now I have no stage nerves at all. I just look forward to going on. I don't have any stage nerves. I'm very unlike most performers, because I can just eat a, like a big meal just before going on stage. In fact, I always have a big meal to give me sustenance for the journey, for, for the show. And um, so I don't get nervous now. Do you have a specific meal, or is it just any big meal? Uh, it's uh, specifically the uh, Last Supper. It's, modelled on the Last Supper of Jesus. Uh, it's a combination of the uh, combination of um, uh, 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 Middle Eastern uh, dishes uh, that Jesus would have had at the time, such as um, hummus with the uh, <laughs> and, uh, and other things that they would have had. Uh, like uh, the f loaves and the fishes. I mix it in with some of the parables. So I have the wine turned into water, loaves and fishes, and then I eat and drink the blood of Christ. Lovely. Yes. Uh, each year, it's quite, uh, I have to have um, my meal blessed by a bishop um, in order for it, of course, to be, you know, uh, the, the, the Last Supper. I could, of course, it doesn't have to be a bishop. It could be any priest, but I always insist on a bishop um, higher up. I always think better off with a bishop because I've had bad experiences with the priests, with bogus priests, who've said to me that they've blessed it and turned it into the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, and that they hadn't lied to me. Junior priests um, who told me a pack of lies, and. Um, uh, they, they did it under false pretenses um, in order to in, entice me uh, into the uh, vestry. Now, I ought to say for legal reasons, for legal reasons, I'm not suggesting they were enticing me into the vestry for sexual reasons. I know there's been a lot of uh, controversy of that nature in the church. They weren't... Um, uh, they weren't doing it for sexual reasons. Uh, they were doing it for social reasons because they wanted me uh, in the vestry uh, for a um, cheese and wine party. Ah. And uh, it was a combination, a cheese and pineapple on sticks uh, with wine, non-consecrated wine, just normal wine. Mm. Um, uh, but they wanted me in there and uh, they tricked me in there with the offer of having consecrated the Last Supper, which of course wasn't true. Um, so yes, I, I, I don't trust the, the lower, the, the trainee priests particularly, and the lower priests. I always trust the bishops and the archbishops 
preferably I get an archbishop to do it. Um, because you know um, that when they do tempt you into the vestry, and of course the bishops do, they still tempt you into the vestry, but it's, uh, well, <laughs> well, I went, I'm, well, well, I shouldn't go into it. Um, I mean, so I, for legal reasons, for legal reasons, I should point out um, that uh, I have been having an affair with a number of bishops. But, um, well, I, I, uh, for legal reasons, I should point out that when I said it wasn't sexual going into the vestry, <laughs> it, it is sexual. But I should point, for legal reasons, I should point out I'm not at all defaming the church. For legal reasons, I should point out I was the one tempting them in. I was the one under false pretenses. It was the <laughs> trainee priests, a uh, little bit naive, and then I would tempt them into the vestry, and uh, then I'd say, oh, how about... Uh... Anyway, so the point, <laughs> I don't want to go into it because it's a subject of legal action, and I can't speak about it for legal reasons. But yes, I have tricked some of the trainee priests into... <laughs> into well allegedly i have tricked them into the sex sessions but that's why i now <laughs> now i always get a bishop or an archbishop because they're more experienced and well to be honest it's the archbishops themselves who were annoyed they said look we're having an affair paul why are you getting all these trainee priests involved you know you're, you're two-timing me and we're supposed to be having an affair and they said if you're two timing me with the archbishop, there's not much I can do about that. I mean, the archbishop is a, above me in the pecking order. But please don't, please don't two time me with these trainee priests who are, let's face it, less, you know, sexually experienced than than me, the bishop. And I then I did say, well, I I I agree, Bishop. Even though we were having an affair, I always called them Bishop. I always kept the formalities. Even though it was a very informal, obviously. I mean, I would go in, put my hand up the Bishop's frock. Uh, the Bishop would uh, put his hand out of the cassock and, um, you know, uh, do the sexual things with me. All, all above board, all legal. I should point out for legal reasons, all above board. But anyway, the point <laughs> is, it was very informal in that way. You know, we would we would just do things with each other whenever we wanted. But I'd always keep, thank you, Bishop. After the session was over, I'd always say, thank you, Bishop. And um, uh, the Bishop would always keep it very informal. Uh, thank you, Blessed One. And um, and uh, make the, the Bishop would make the sign of the, uh, of the cross. And that was in order to close up the cassock that had been pulled open, of course. Anyway, um, the point is, they said to me, don't bother with a trainee priest because it's not as good. And I did agree, the trainee priest, it was no, there was no point, it was not as good. So I, uh, that's why I always go with the senior, senior clergy now when I'm doing the sex session, a bishop, archbishop, or occasionally a canon. <laughs> as, a, as a sort of a, you know, a little something, something a bit different on, on the odd occasion. An archdeacon, I have, yes, I have, on a few occasions, um, well, a few occasions, I have um, maybe been with a bishop, and the bishop said, I've got something hidden, sort of up my sleeve, and it is up the sleeve, because I rip open the cassock, and there's an archdeacon inside. Before I know it, I'm in a, in a sort of threesome situation with the archdeacon. And, um, but I don't mind. In fact, I encourage it. I mean, I mean, I'm the one sort of egging them on, really. I am, really. A lot of the time, the bishops and the archbishops have said, we don't want to do this anymore. We're, we're tired. We're, we're fed up with it. And I say, look, one more time, just turn up um, in the, in the uh, crypt uh, with a couple of archdeacons, and you, you'll, you'll know, you won't hear from me again. I blackmail them. I pretend that it's the last they'll hear from me. But like any blackmailer, I'm always back for more. Yeah, I say one more, one more. It's always one more, you know. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's, that's the situation. Uh, what was the question? 
was it, it was what meal do you eat before your show? Oh, yes, the meal before the show. And you, yes, you replied the last supper, yeah. Oh, the meal before the show. I yeah. should point so, out, uh, for legal reasons, I should point out that everything I just said about the consecrated thing and about all the affairs with the bishops and so on, for legal reasons, I should point out that was lies. And I should okay. point out that, in fact, the meal I have before going on stage is steak and kidney pudding. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. 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 Now, for uh, me and Thomas uh, should and also should point, point out legal for legal reasons. reasons. Oh, sorry, so for legal reasons, I should point out everything I said about the bishops and the archdeacons, all that was lies. I've never <laughs> had any affairs or sexual dalliances with anyone from the clergy, other than the flower <laughs> arranger. There is the flower arranger who works at a local church, Jeanette. A few times I've had a thing with Jeanette, but that was, it was, it was, it wasn't, it was never on church property. It was, uh, well, but basically on her way home from the flower arranging, she'd pop into my house uh, on the way home to see her husband and uh, <coughs> pop in for a quickie. But it was nothing to do with the church. She happens to work as a flower arranger, nothing to do with the church. She does have the keys to the church, being a flower arranger, so she can let herself in. On one occasion, just because my house was being redecorated. We did once do it in the bell tower, but it was just one time, but that is the only time. Uh, so I'm just saying for legal reasons, we <laughs> don't have the church in it. There was the one, well, there, were what, there was one other time when, the, um, uh, when uh, w w one of the lay preachers was there. It was a threesome with a lay preacher. Uh, but, uh, and that was, um, it was done on the. It was done in one of the uh, one of the smaller chapels that no one ever goes in normally. It's like one of the little chapels, and it's dedicated to the some obscure saint, and no one ever goes that way. I, unfortunately, on the occasion when I was doing the sex session, that's the one time that someone did go that way, and uh, it did turn into a bit of an orgy. Jesus Christ! Anyway, <laughs> that's the one time I hold my hands up. The one time, okay, I had an orgy in the uh, in the Saint Saint Augustine's Chapel in the church. Well, that's the one time. The rest of the time, I'm all and part in the one time it calls up the bell star. Apart from that, um, uh, and yeah, that's it. And um, if uh, if uh, an art, if an archdeacon ever says, uh, "Would you would you like me to take you up the bell tower?" Don't accept. Because it is a euphemism. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you literally will go up the bell. You will go up the bell tower, both literally and figuratively. Don't accept, because it is actually quite painful. Well, I draw the line at that. I've done most things with 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 the with, with you know. In, I've done a lot of things, but I won't do that. Anyway, <laughs> that's the end of my question. I have nothing further to say on on the matter for legal reasons. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, ju yeah, just all right for legal reasons. I think me and Thomas should mention uh, we do not condone uh, <laughs> sexual acts in in, the <laughs> in a church, but uh, those we yes, can yes, we can excuse yes. we can excuse those. Yeah, yes, yes, you know yes. things happen. Things happen. Things happen. It was uh, it was a mistake, and uh, every sinner has a past, as they say. Exactly. Uh, every saint has a future, but not Saint Augustine. There's no future, unfortunately, for St. Augustine because of the fact that uh, part of the sex session involved um, leaning across the, uh, the tomb and it cracked <laughs> under the weight of all the people. Anyway, I've nothing else to say. Nothing else to say. This is the awfully Irish podcast and the last thing that anyone would want on an Irish podcast is anything to do with the church, the, yeah, with the Catholic church. nature. That would be the last thing that would be on on there. I have to and if I now. say any more, I'm I'm throwing away any hope I get of being on the We Are Welsh podcast. Okay. Yep. Uh, how many more questions are there? Because the answers to that took over four hours. So I just want to make sure that <laughs> I keep the answers to the other answers brief. <laughs> Um, um, just because I have got, got an appointment next um, 
Thursday afternoon um, <laughs> do a Tresedo flower arranging woman. But anyway, it doesn't matter. About <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, about two more, two or three more questions. Anyway, not, not, not too. I, I want to know: um, Is there a time on stage where you just blanked, and um, what did you do in that situation, or what would you do in a situation where you blank on stage? I don't think I have blanked for quite a long time on stage. As you might have noticed by my answer to the previous question, I have an ability to improvise, yes. make stuff up, <laughs> often from not very much. So, you know, if I'm on stage and I'm in the middle of talking about something, if I forget what I was about to say next, I can always just make something up. Uh, that's the what's so fun about stand-up. There is no script. It is an improvisational experience. You can have things you've planned, but ultimately one is up there as an improviser. I think maybe when I was less experienced many, many years ago, I did sometimes sort of go on and not know what to say, and it was really rather, rather awkward, you know, just sort of silent sort of nightmare, just standing there, can't think what to say. But it doesn't happen um, anymore. It does, I do sometimes, um, I'm in the middle of improvising something, and you might have noticed with the answer to the previous question, sometimes I think, oh my God, what am I saying? <laughs> you start improvising and you think, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying this thing. There was one time um, when I was, yeah, I remember there was, I was in, it was a secret show. I do these secret shows with audience members and I roam around the audience <clears throat> making stuff up with them. And I was just really insulting people in the audience. And I said to this man, he didn't pay tax and he was a tax avoider. And all sorts of terrible things. I thought, oh my God, he'll probably never come to a show again. But he realised it was all improvisation and he comes to shows every time now. But yes, um, yes sometimes one does find with improvising, you, you sort of think, oh my God, where am I going with it? But uh, one nearly always, one always rescues, well, you know, it's always fine, uh, as long as no bishops or archbishops tune in. Um. One of the more earlier pieces I've seen you do is your your part on uh, Russell Howard with the uh, <laughs> the Shire horses. Oh, was, Shire horses. Was that improvised, <laughs> or was that? Um, well, I suppose it's um, it's a compliment to me that you think it was improvised. Um, it was a piece of comedy I had about Shire horses, and it goes on for about eighteen minutes. And yes, it's uh, it was it was improvised in the sense that it started with me going on stage, a bit like your previous question, which is what is your meal before going on stage? And I just made stuff up from that. And in the same way, I thought it would be interesting to just talk about the, how the number of Shire horses is declining, and then just improvise from there. And then, and I think the first time was at a new material night and I improvised something about the number of Shire horses going down for five minutes or so. And then as I kept on performing it at different places, it gradually um, expanded until it became a sort of 20 minute piece. And then eventually it sort of wrote itself and it had a structure and the things from the beginning came back at the end and it was very clever the way it was structured. Um, so it was a combination of writing on stage in other words improvising on stage and sort of then writing in between the shows and then formally structuring it and uh until it became a a, a piece i mean one doesn't want to give too much away but i suppose people could know by by uh, looking at what i did on television and by listening to my cd which has the same piece on and by seeing other times I did the same piece. It is a scripted piece, but I'm glad that it looked like it could be improvised because that, of course, is one of my skills, the skills of all comedians, is to go on and recreate the same thing over and over again. And in, indeed, a lot of stuff that I do and I think other comedians do are things that have been improvised at the time and you just do them. There are things that I've done in shows. One doesn't want to give too much away, but there are things that I've done in shows where um, I had a, 
a, a show that was planned and then something would happen like I tripped over or something and I made some improvised improvise something from it and then I would just recreate that I'd think well that was good so I would every time trip over and every time so the same line and make it look like it was the first time I said it and um, so people enjoy it but one doesn't want to analyze too much so spoils a sort of illusion which we all have to do as comedians we all have to you know in a way you're saying oh well, oh i was thinking about this last week or you know and everyone sort of knows that it didn't i i find it extraordinary though how much audience audiences tend to take what they see on stage literally and I mean, an example of this is not really on stage exactly, but it's the same principle. Uh, the other day I was doing something on Instagram, I did a video and I was just making it up at the time. And it was all nonsense about how I had some lover who had to get in and out through the window, like getting a grand piano in and out of the house. And it, and it was ridiculous sort of improvisation. It was a funny thing I did that I put on Instagram. People can see it if they go to my Instagram archive. I did two or three one minute videos about it and it was funny. And then I was then showing it to uh, sort of a friend of a friend who was in my garden a couple of days later. And she was saying, is this true? And the whole thing was ridiculous. I mean, how could you possibly imagine that I had moved someone in and out of my window, like on a crane? It was so ludicrous, but people tend to take things quite literally which I find interesting. I mean, sometimes I've been on stage, I remember once doing a show and um, Sam Simmons, the Australian comedian was coming on after me. It was in Melbourne and he actually was in the room. I think I'd overrun or I don't think I would have overrun in an unprofessional way, but I'd overrun because my show started late because of something before or something. So he was in the room and then he's, I think said something and I said something to him and I was insulting him and saying he's the worst person I've ever met and like there was this like ridiculous sort of thing between us and then someone in the audience said is this true and like do you really have like is he really like your enemy and then I had to kind of there was a slightly awkward moment and I had to kind of deconstruct it and sort of say well think about it if he really was my enemy would I really be saying these things on stage in front of an audience? He obviously isn't, because we're obviously both having a laugh about it. But yes, people tend to take things quite literally. Yeah. Well, talking about people taking things literally, uh, you know, nowadays people tend to not really get jokes often. And they're like, oh, you know, this offends me. I don't like you. Uh, and I was just wondering, like, you know, as a comedian, obviously, you, people get hecklers uh, during shows and stuff. And I was just wondering, do you get a lot of hecklers? I don't get a lot of hecklers now because, of course, I tend to be doing my own shows nowadays in a theatre. Yeah. Um, sometimes you can get people interacting in a good-natured way. Yeah. Usually, if I, I've normally asked a question for that time, very occasionally someone will put their hand up or say something. In terms of hecklers in that sort of, in the way we mean of people saying something to sort of, uh, in a sort of um, hostile way, yeah. not so much now, uh, because, um, yes, it might occasionally happen at some other show somewhere. Um, yeah. uh, it's interesting, he heckling uh, is, uh, I mean, I've, I've never had any really, uh, preparations for he hecklers I just uh, any put downs as it were I tend to just take it you know be in the moment think about what's said if it's meant in a good natured way then that's one thing if it's meant not good natured then there's another way of looking at it but I just I'm in the moment and I just improvise around the situation and normally if necessary ridicule them if I have to in order to assert authority and if yeah. it's just a good natured, I don't need to do that. I remember once in Belfast and um, it, that really quite rough gig, I don't know whether it's still the, the Empire, Belfast, I don't know whether that's even going anymore, but 
remember a long time ago doing it and I was really struggling on stage. It wasn't going well. And then I think a man shouted, get off your rubbish or something. But uh, that actually then allowed me to go back at him. And then that allowed me to get the audience on my side because I started to sort of ridicule him and they got on my side and actually turned the gig around. And then I think it was all ended quite well yeah by the end i think it was only a 10 minute performance it would have been about 20 years ago a long time ago mm. but yes it was um it ended much better than it started because of that and i think he even came up to me at the end and said he did it deliberately to help me so actually sometimes even hecklers even so-called hostile hecklers are often there to help you mm. and it's interesting how um that stand-up comedy, as a comedian, when one is on stage, one often feels that things are very personal. If someone heckles, you feel uh, really threatened by it. Um, and I suppose it's an error of the inexperienced to feel very threatened. But actually, you need to think about it as a sort of technician on stage, and you need to think, well, what can, what can I get out of this, and is it really a threat? Uh, I suppose what I'm, sa what I'm saying is, for example, sometimes people might say something that is a bit aggressive, but it's not really meant aggressively, it's meant in a good-natured way. And I, I see sometimes comedians will overreact because they will take it too much to heart, and they'll overreact and then actually spoil what was a good opportunity for something good-natured. They can yeah. still they could still have a go at the heckler in a good-natured way and put them down and blah, blah, blah. But because they take it too much to heart, they take it too personally, then they misjudge the situation and actually make the situation worse for them. I remember yeah. once, years ago, doing a gig in London, and it was just, anyway, it was before Christmas and there was a real party sort of atmosphere. And I remember, uh, I don't think... They were going with my jokes that well and they were sort of i can't remember but there was there was this big group of women who were like in a hindu or something and they were all saying you're rubbish get off blah 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 and i remembered there was a sort of uh, battle between me and them and i said i'm not gonna leave and they were saying get off and i was saying no i'm not gonna leave i've got another joke i'm gonna do this or whatever and it was going backwards and forwards and there was a battle that i think ultimately i didn't i think i lost the battle on that occasion and they all end up going, get off, get off, you know, and I left. And, um, but it was all kind of quite entertaining for the audience. They enjoyed the sort of battle of it, and the fact I was battling. And then I remember afterwards leaving and then uh, bumping into, as I left, I had to go down a sort of alleyway and all these women were there. And I thought, oh dear, I've got to go past them. And I remember as I went past, they all said, oh, happy Christmas. Oh, yeah, we enjoyed your performance. It was really great have a nice Christmas. And that really reinforced to me then, it wasn't personal. And actually when they were saying, you're rubbish, get off, they didn't even mean it. They actually enjoyed it. They were having fun. It was just part of their sport. So, and actually the whole audience enjoyed the performance. What they wouldn't have enjoyed is if I'd just given up. They enjoyed the fact I battled. And even though I lost in inverted commas at the end, because it was like, get off, get off, get off. And I had to sort of leave. To them like booing me or something it wasn't personal it was just a bit of fun so that's i think some something that um the less experienced performers uh, sometimes forget it's uh, with very rare exceptions and there are exceptions when it is personal and it really is unpleasant there really are horrible people with very rare exceptions it's not personal no one mm -hmm. really cares it's just a bit of fun you know yeah and I like that about comedians. And a lot of them tend to use hecklers to their advantage. Oh, yeah. People like uh, Jimmy Carney, who would like, he'd stop his show and he'd get people to heckle them. And it's like, people, comedians tend to use it to their advantage to get a laugh and to, you know, make something out of it. And I think that's really cool. It's a good way to get a laugh. Yeah. When, you see, when you see a comedian having a go at a heckler, it's, it's always entertaining. And we all know those kind of tricks in a way, as comedians, and we shouldn't give too much away, I suppose. But <laughs> one, uh, a friend the other day, who is not a comedian, 
she was showing me a clip. It was of Jack Whitehall yes. performing, and something happened where he said something. To, I can't even remember what it was, but he said, and she, he said something to someone in the audience, and they said something, and he was all kind of shocked by what they'd said, and uh, like stopped performing. Oh, that's right. It was something to do. With, he said, oh, "I'm so embarrassed. Oh my God." Oh, that's right. That's what it was. He said, "Oh, um, is that that's your it's to a man, or that's your daughter, or something?" And then he said, "It's actually my wife." And he was like, "Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I thought it was your daughter, but it's actually your wife." And he like dropped the microphone and was like, "Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed." And the whole audience was like, "Oh my God, oh my God, no, that's just <laughs> happened." And the the friend said, "Oh, it's an amazing clip because he." just has to stop the gig, he's so embarrassed, it's amazing. But of course, as a professional watching it, one knows that it's kind of confected in a way, that he's not that bothered about it. It's just like, you play the moment, you're like, oh my God, this big moment's happened when you thought it was the daughter, but it's actually the wife. But as a performer, you're sort of thinking, yeah, this is fun, this is interesting, this is a nice energy, this is exciting. And it's not that big a deal. And there's many, many times, I'm sure we've all done it, where we've all pretended that something was a real big moment. And, it, and I don't want to give too much away, but there are times when, um, uh, for example, I've got a routine, which I sometimes do, and it's all about the gay babies, how the gay babies made. And it's all to do with if someone's heterosexual or, and then they, how do the heterosexual people make the gay babies? And I do it like a bit with audience member, which is sort of interactive, where I say, are oh, you heterosexual? Have you got a girlfriend? And how could you go and make a gay baby? And blah, blah, blah. And I've had sort of things happen uh, where it turns out that the person who we initially thought was heterosexual isn't as heterosexual as we thought because they kind of reveal they're not as heterosexual and I will then sort of say, oh my God, I can't believe that's happened. They're not as heterosexual as we thought, and blah, blah, blah. And, like, and it's like a big moment for the audience. Oh my God, that's happened. Oh, what a revelation. But actually, I've done the routine so many, many times, probably hundreds of times, that that very same scenario has happened maybe dozens of times. So I'm actually going through something that's happened many times before. And it's not new at all. It doesn't happen that often, but it's happened many times before when one makes a thing of it. In the same way, Jack, Jack Whitehall would have had moments like that many times before. When, ooh, that's a bit embarrassing. Anyway, one shouldn't give too much away, but that's part of what we do, mm. I suppose. Cool. And then uh, for the last question, um, excluding yourself, who would be your favourite comedian? Well, that's an interesting question. When you say excluding myself, um, because it would sound, I suppose, terribly um, egotistical and narcissistic to say, oh, yes, I would be my favourite comedian. But I suppose, <laughs> in a way, I would be my favourite comedian because I suppose, and I don't, this might not be the case for all comedians, but certainly for me, I do the sort of comedy that if I were an audience member, I would want to see. That's what I've always done. I always think when I'm creating new comedy or doing it, I always think, okay, what would I want to see? And I'm also, I suppose I would want to see myself, but I suppose um, um, there are some comedians who are really into lots of com comedians and some of them, I'm not one of those comedians who's kind of into comedy that much, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And if I wasn't into doing comedy, I probably wouldn't go to see comedians that much because a lot of comedy, I sort of think, mm, I don't know, it's not my thing. But I, uh, my three favourites, I suppose, are Sam Campbell in Australia and Tim Vine. I love Tim Vine. It's so utterly brilliant and pointless. And I say pointless in the, in the most complimentary way. The absolute pointlessness of it is fantastic. And Simon Munnery as well. And in fact, before the uh, uh, coronavirus crisis came in, which sort of stopped this idea for the moment, I had the idea that I would just go and see 
maybe Tim Vine and Simon Munnery, just as an audience member, just buy a ticket, go and watch them and just enjoy it. Um, because, uh, and this is going to sound narcissistic again, because I, but it's not meant like this, but I know that Tim Vine and Simon Munnery are fans of my comedy, but maybe they're fans of mine because I'm doing something that somehow, I don't know, there must be some synergy between us. I remember a little while ago, uh, Simon Munnery came to a show of mine about a year ago in Bedford, and then afterwards I said, um, did he laugh or did he kind of analyse it? And he said, maybe 10% of the time he analysed stuff, but 90% of the time he just laughed, just enjoyed it. See, so yeah, I'd like to go and see Simon Munnery just as an audience member, not sitting there thinking, um, well, how would I have done that? Oh, that's an interesting idea. Would I do that? Just enjoy it. And um, it'll be really fun. And uh, Simon Munnery is one of those people who sometimes... The performance can just be a shambles, but even when it's not its best performance, it's always so watchable. There's something about him that is just brilliant. Like it doesn't, it's always fantastic. Even if it's all just falling apart at the seams, it's just brilliant to watch. Uh, Tim Vine, another one is someone who, he does these stupid, silly, when I say stupid in the complimentary way, it's stupid things that are just not worth watching, but they are, because it's just brilliant. He's <laughs> such a brilliant performance performer. So yes, I, I would go to see that uh, when the lockdown is over. Fair enough, sir. Yeah. Oh, thanks for getting on, Paul. You've been <coughs> a great, great guest. Oh, thank Lovely you. talking to you. Uh, well, anyway, we, we hope this... Uh, boosts you onto the uh, We Are Welsh podcast anyway. Oh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, thank yeah, you. We'll, we'll, we'll message thank them you. and see if, if they'll take it. Oh, thank you. And, um, well, um, well, um, how, how do you end the podcast normally? Is it like this? <laughs> you just leave it to your guests to end it like this? And this I'll end it. So I usually, um, you know, someone usually says, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Remember to like, subscribe, tell your grandmother about the podcast and take her handy. Um, so thank you. It's been the Awfully Irish Podcast. And good luck. <laughs>